So welcome uh, for this session, which is a joint session uh, with our friends at Wolfenbüttel. So you see here uh, Lucien Shepard, who is um, a third year student in, of German and French on his year abroad. And he's currently doing an internship at the Herzog August Bibliothek. And obviously there are strong links between the Bodleian and the Herzog August Bibliothek through the digitization of medieval manuscripts, but it also extends to um, early modern prints. And uh, Lucien did last year the course of Emma Huber for digital editing and edited um, one particularly fascinating miscellany, which is the smallest item here on display. Uh, here, actually, this one, which is uh, a composite of uh, five different European languages, all centered around St. Margaret. And what we are going to do today is uh, talking briefly about who uh, put together these compilations, namely Francis Daus, a notable a donor to the Bodleian Library. And um, we'll leave through this compilation. Then uh, Lucien is going to talk about his edition. I'm very pleased uh, that also the current digital edition students are here with Emma Huber. So we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, the technical side, but then uh, talk further about the content side and the cut and paste approach of Francis Daus to um, early modern books, which you can find scandalizing, but it's a fascinating detective work to find out where he got his material from. So the surrounding material, the big books, are uh, some of the source material he cut from. And Lucien is actually going to show something uh, from the Wolfenbüttel uh, collection that all uh, delivers something that the Bodleian doesn't have of uh, the source material. Um, first, Alan Coates has said he would uh, say a few words about Francis Daus, uh, the cut and paste person. Could you come further forward so that, that uh, Lucien can hear you speaking as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm you not can... quite sure I should stand. No, that's perfect. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, oh, thank you. I will just say, say a few words about Daus, who, who, whose name you probably know very well. You may well know an awful lot about his collections. So I apologise if I say anything that's already well known to you. Daus was keeper of manuscripts at the British Museum from 1887 to 1811. And if, if any of you get the chance to look at um, a and L. Mungby's Connoisseurs and Medieval Mistress, there is a wonderful transcription of the memo that Dow sent around about why he resigned from the BM. It was written in 1811, but there are so many shades of 2020, 2021, 22. Uh, he obviously didn't like committees, which we can all synchronize. <laughs> um, he had certain views on readers, which I won't pursue. Um, you have problem with his routine, and I won't even go there. So it's worth looking at that. This perhaps, um, some people might think that this may well have coloured why, having fallen out spectacularly with the museum, he decided to leave his collections here. In fact, I think the story is rather more complicated in a nice way. Daus was on a visit in the summer of 1830, in July 1830, to Isaac Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli's father. And they came to Disraeli's house in High Wycombe and um, Daus had arranged from Frederick Madden of the BM to have an introduction to come to the Bodleian Library. And he came and was shown round by Bulkley Bandonel, the then librarian. Bandonel made a considerable fuss of him, I think, showed him the collections, gave him dinner. And that is one of the reasons why it is suspected that um, Daus decided to leave his material to, to, the, to the University of Oxford and the Bodleian particularly. Again, I think a little more complicated than that. Um, the particular thing that Daus, that, that attracted Daus to the Bodleian was his, that was being sh shown the collections given by previous donors, John Seldon, Richard Goff, Richard Goff, who we knew particularly, kept separate. He liked the idea of named collections being kept separate and Bandonel promised that 
you know, this was the way the bottling would proceed, and Dow's obviously liked that. And Isaac Disraeli noted um, subsequently that he felt that this was the moment after this visit when Dow's went home. He thought about this and thought, right, this was the place for his, his material to come to. So when he died in 1834, um, he changed his will and all his books, manuscripts, coins, medals. Perhaps I ought to try to say a little put a bit of quantity on this. 420 medieval manuscripts, and I'm going to wait to be shot down on that one. 479 incunables, and I think I'm right on that one. 19,000 plus printed books. The coins, the medals. We didn't get the suits of armor, and I quite forget where the armor went to. It would have been, I think, rather nice if we'd had the armor. Um, <laughs> but the coins and the medals, of course, and a lot of the prints are now in the Ashmolean, um, where they form a hugely important part of the collection, and which some of which will sort of trespass, I think, Henrika into the areas that are going to be talked about, yeah. the, the um, chopping and pasting or whatever. The University of Oxford was obviously thrilled to have such a such um, a request. Uh, sadly, not everybody was quite as ecstatic about this, and I'm just going to finish by reading a little uh, comment from Frederick Madden. Frederick Madden, of course, who'd introduced who'd introduced uh, Dow's to Bandanel. Madden writing to Thomas Phillips in 4th of April 1834. Poor Dow died on Sunday morning last. He is said to have left all his printed books, manuscripts, prints and coins to the Bodleian Library. I'm quite vexed at Dow's disposition of his collections. To leave them to the Bodleian is to throw them down a bottomless pit. <laughs> they will never be catalogued, bound or preserved, but suffer to sleep on with Goff, Rawlinson and Tanner, undisturbed above <laughs> once in a luster by some prying individual of antiquarian celebrity. I slightly feel a bit <laughs> insulted, I, collectively for all of us, I think we're beyond being um, prying antiquarians. But we subsequently have had the great benefit of, of Dowse's collections, and I hope that you will all, if you haven't used Dowse material, you, you will have a chance to use it. One thing, just by very, uh, by very final way of putting something else, Henrika, to your display, I brought a picture, which I will leave somewhere on the table. Thank you. <laughs> I mentioned Douse, like the, the, particularly found particularly um, uh, important the idea of collections being kept together. When Douse's material came to the library, it was housed in the book stack. Now, the book stack in 1834 was, as you will probably all know, and this picture shows the Douse room in 1939 and the Douse room is what today we might well think of as I would think of as the patristics room but um, uh, the theology reading room in the lower reading room where there is still the board the museum Douseanum board on the wall showing the collection's name so if you want to see what where these books were in 1939 when we still use the lower reading room as a book stack that picture is there thank you Henry, thank you that's perfect. Um, I, I think um, we'll lead through this uh, volume now. So, uh, Michael, if you would uh, come close so that the others who can't, um, you are all welcome to come a bit closer, but um, if we just lead through it, um, once uh, the whole content of the volume. So you see first a woodcut, um, then um, notes by Daus and his coat of arms. You can come a little bit closer here. Um, then uh, you see first a French text uh, printed with red ink and woodcuts also colored in in red and some uh, corrections in French so um, I'll leave through it quickly and then uh, you see here beginneth of St. Margarete, the blissed leaf that is so sweet. 
uh, to Jesu Christe, she is fully data, or however you pronounce, uh, with some marginalia. Then you see a tiny, uh, Lucien, is it a copper plate? I think so. I think it is a copper plate that's been cut out. Where from? And then you see a Dutch text, Wollenspiegel, uh, with a has a hymnus or lofsang in Catholican priestess, Te Ehren van Sante Margareta, um, in first in Latin Margareta multis spreta, then desen hymnus can oak in Dutch van de Romsche Uhlen gerollt, of gesungen worden, ob de Wiese als folgt. Uh, apologies for my Plattdeutsch rather than Dutch pronunciation. And then uh, you end with another woodcut that you can see comes from the same edition. And um, this is actually culled from a Spanish uh, life of St. Margaret. All of this you can study in detail in the edition that Lucien has done. So over to you, uh, Lucien, and talking about uh, what you did. And um, do you want us to keep focusing on the actual object or do you want to share screen? Um, maybe on for us here to see it, maybe on the actual object would be a bit nicer. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, so, firstly, um, I'd like to begin with some, with some, well, to say my thanks really to, to some people, to firstly to Henrika Lehnemann and Alison Ray and Emma Huber, uh, because really without their support and encouragement, um, this would not have gotten anywhere and I probably would not have even started it. Um, so really, thank you so much for that. Um, so, Whilst, the, whilst both the edition and the catalogue um, may only be called or be listed as La Vie de Sainte Marguerite, um, I was, as I said, a very quick email to Emma Huber, I, uh, that this, this diversity, this range of other material bound in together alongside it was what really drew me to it. So just to repeat then the contents of it, we have the, uh, the front and rear end leaves two woodcuts of the life of St. Margaret, taken from Pedro de la Veja's Flos Sanctorum, uh, printed in Medina del Campo in 1578. Then, uh, just after that, we have the middle French text, La Vie de Sainte Marguerite, from around 1495 with the woodcuts. Um, it is also missing a folio, folio eight, um, A8. So that's why, actually, we missed the whole bit about the dragon. Um, then after that, we have two folios, folios two, two and five of a Middle English Life of St. Margaret. Then we have on the lower fly leaf, um, a, this cut out copper plate image of St. Margaret stuck on to a, a, another page. And then, as Henrika said, two folios from uh, from a Dutch book, namely Den Römschen Eulenspiegel, uh, printed in Dordrecht in 1671, so actually much later than the rest of the text. So, as you can tell, this range brings up actually a, a particularly important point for, for digital traditions and digital humanities, namely, you have to know where to draw the line and what you do and don't encode, and I think this is a very this is a, an important thing to remember and it's something that will always come up. Um, there is so many details which you could include, but there is simply not enough time and not enough means to do so. Uh, for example, in the Middle English part, um, there, so we saw the marginalia there, um, and even with the very good help of my friend, uh, Michael Anger, who I believe is holding the camera, uh, we both, we both struggled to form any complete sentences. Um, we worked out that, well, um, that there were some bits in Latin and some bits in English, but as lovely as it was, I had to say, we'll just have to leave it out. Um, one aspect, however, which I did decide to encode uh, was 
tracking, tracking the various scribal hands throughout the manuscript because we have these various texts bound in together. Um, and this was, however, a bit complicated by the fact that in the middle French text, we have, uh, we have these corrections, which someone decided to add in later. Um, if you go on to folio A6 recto, um, I'll just wait for you. And towards the bottom of the page should be uh, on the line, lui dirant tout, uh, dirant tout ce quoi, mon seigneur. Um, the, the person has corrected dirant, uh, or the E in dirant, first to an O, but then decided actually they're wrong and, and then wrote above it another E, if you can see that there. Yes. Um, so, um, as, uh, as someone who'd never done anything with TI, with XML before, any form of coding, this was a, a little bit tricky to wrap my head around at first, but actually I think this is something that's relatively simple to encode, with the caveat that if your manuscript has many overlapping hands, maybe not, maybe not. Um, and then one last very common hurdle to, to discuss is, as when you are transcribing, there are often words with multiple readings. Um, and I, I decided from the beginning that, um, that it would be valuable to create two versions, a, a diplomatic and critical edition, a transcription of the text, of the Middle French text. Um, this, however, did lead to a lot of playing around with I's and J's and U's, N's and V's, um, all leading to various possible words. Um, and um, with the very generous help of Dr. Burroughs, we together were able to work out what they should be. Um, but it did open another can, a whole can of worms, um, namely about scansion, about the meter, because this was a text that was written in, in regular eight syllable verses. Um, and even as if you try and normalize it, uh, you can try and try, but again, you have to know your limit at what is what is actually valuable. Um, Sorry, Lucien, I, I stopped. I tried to share the edition, but um, failed to do so. Could you try now to, uh, I think now is the point to uh, for the big reveal of how you actually yeah. encoded it. There, can you see that? Yep. So, I can go to. Ah, uh, so if we go to a yes, so scroll down here, and so here again we have folio A six recto and la, and there you can see the lui dirons tous quoi, monseigneur, um, and so for example you have mu. Um, uh, in the in the actual text, but there were a lot of printing errors, and and so for the what's here on this platform called the translation, I corrected that to mon with an n. Um, so, um, so I I did have a, allow a few indulgences um, into the history of this manuscript. So working backwards, so uh, in time. The, the, two, the two Dutch folios fortunately did not, po did not pose much of a problem. Um, and in fact, I shall show you the, the full copy, which we have uh, here at the Herzog August Bibliothek. So if... Yeah. I, um, I, I'll use that moment uh, while you are tr trying to share to also welcome a group from uh, Berlin uh, Oxford Partnership. They are working on a, a group of texts uh, that uh, is actually uh, also a kind of composite uh, multi uh, language uh, complex of the seven sages or seven wise men or uh, lots of different uh, names. So very pleased that you uh, happened to be coming for, for this uh, weekend. <laughs> Camera and Wolfenbüttel trying to zoom in. <laughs> it's a tiny uh, volume, so it's uh, these uh, smallest two, two leaves in here. 
from the Uhlenspiegel. Coming. Oh, that, can you see that well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, da, ich glaube, ja, perfekt. Okay, so, da, 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 da. so as you can see here, can you still hear, hear me okay? Yeah. Wonderful. So, um, so as you can see here, we have um, a stamp which shows that this actual book came from the, uh, from the, Helmstetter University, um, where a lot of actually books were came to the from where a lot of books came from the Herzog August Bibliothek. So you can see you can read here just about it's quite faded. Ex Bibliotheca Academie Julie Caroline Helmstetti. Um, uh, so yes, and then if we look at So here is the a really wonderful copper plate image, um, uh, which gives us a hint about what the title is actually about. So you see here, den römischen Eulenspiegel auf der Lust auf der Katholische. So, and we see here this wonderful owl, a priest, and at the bottom it reads, the pep, uh, the pep, oh, can I I'll read it on screen? The pep Eulenspiegel cares in Brill. Vertonen, wat ich lesen will. So the priest, owl, mirror, cross, and glasses um, tell, should show you, shows you what I what I'm what I want to say, what I wish to say. Um, and in fact, this refers back not to as you might think uh, immediately of Till Eulenspiegel, the famous Nar um, from Nuremberg and Ausberg. Uh, but rather, actually, a Dutch uh, saying, namely, "Wat baten kers en bril as the niet zien en wil," which translates as, "What good is a candle or glasses when the owl doesn't wish to see?" Um, and the meaning of that is, in English, if somebody doesn't want to learn, there's no use in helping them to do so. So this is quite um, unusual and slightly comedic saying quite uh, neatly reflects the didactic purpose of this uh, of this uh, of this book um, as it too compiles various stories prayers legends hymns um, all for Dutch Roman Catholics to use in private worship um, so I go back. I think, Lucien, we need to move on uh, slightly uh, if you want to show the other book as well um, yeah, um, then yeah. it would be time now. Otherwise, uh, we would switch because I I uh, haven't yet introduced the other Dow's collections here. Uh, I have two more uh, cut and paste jobs. One is uh, Salman and uh, Malkolf, um, uh, witty, obscene collection of uh, dialogues between King Solomon and uh, The Fool, which was also translated in all sorts of languages. And Daus has pasted in the back um, uh, King Solomon from the Nuremberg Chronicles. So he uh, dissected one full uh, edition of the Nuremberg Chronicles uh, and pasted it across his collection of books. And the other thing is um, a Pantra Tantra uh, bit pipe, um, collection again traveled through all the languages like the uh, seven sages where Daus has uh, eagle-eyed spotted that one of the woodcuts was based on Dürer's image of the lobster riding fool so he pasted um, the lobster rider from a latin edition of the ship of fools uh, into it and um, both things I, I was quite pleased to spot, which hadn't been spotted. Uh, so uh, doing something to counter the final statement about the Dao's collection by identifying uh, uh, things. Yeah. Now uh, back to you, Lucien. Uh, so the other thing that I have here today is um, 
So this is also a compilation um, of, but of various, um, various incunable uh, printed by someone called Simon Koch or Simon Menzer. Um, Simon Men there is actually very little as is very common into biographical information about who Simon Koch or Menzer was. Um, we know that he has some sort of connection to Mainz. Um, and we also know that he was active in Meisen, which is near Dresden, but that is pretty much it. Um, so here we have, um, uh, there's various texts in here, three um, uh, hagiographical lives of St. Margaret, St. Barbara, and St. Dorothea. Um, there is also a, um, um, a printed um, uh, Hans Rosenblüts, what is this? Ein, ein Kaiser, Historie von einem Kaiser der Roma. Um, and so, so here we have Sunt Margrethe, Passia, so the Passio of St. Margaret. Again, we have this wonderful, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly whether it's a woodcut or a copper plate, but um, again, we see the, the dragon and, and the cross, this time with just one um, really one sort of horizontal uh, line in the middle. And um, I, I think um, we'll now switch over to having uh, uh, letting people take a look for themselves because we have to vacate the Visiting Scholar yeah. Center for um, a filming session going on at half past. So if people want to come round, uh, but stay on the call, please, uh, Lucy, and then people can um, be in correspondence with you. And many thanks. Yeah,